I am on my way to heaven where the saints are robed in white shouting glory, shouting glory to that blessed land immortal where can never come the night shouting glory all the way Oh glory, hallelujah I am on my way to heaven shouting glory, shouting glory Oh, glory, hallelujah, I am on my way to heaven, shouting glory all the way. I am on my way to heaven, where the streets are paved with gold, shouting glory, shouting glory. To the place of many mansions and of glory yet untold, shouting glory all the way. Oh, glory, hallelujah, I am on my way to heaven, shouting glory, shouting glory. I am on my way, hallelujah, I am on my way to heaven, shouting glory all the way. I am on my way to heaven, where I'll see my Savior's face, shouting glory, shouting glory. There I'll sing redemption story, blessed song and saving grace, shouting glory all the way. Oh, glory, hallelujah, I'm on my way to heaven, shouting glory, shouting glory. Oh, glory, hallelujah, I am on my way to heaven, shouting glory all the way. divine revelation and Lord would you come in great mercy and great power and deliver me from the oppressive illness of our world that uh, the world says has to come with age but Lord you make all things new that's not hard for you so Lord we're asking for deliverance today that the name of Jesus would be praised that in our physical frame there would come a touch. You would make us whole again. By the power of your great Holy Spirit, Lord, come. He's all I need. He's all. Today we're finishing up, I think, maybe the series on heaven. I'm not sure about that. But we're doing session number two on heaven. It's what we believe, part 11. And I just got to thinking, uh, if I could go through the alphabet, could I find a word that describes something about heaven for every letter of the alphabet? So I did that as just a fun exercise. And here it is. A, angels. B, beautiful. C, Christ. D, divinity. E, eternal. F, Family, G, grandeur, H, holiness, E, identity. You know, we're going to be known as we are known. You're going to identify. We'll cover that at the end. Uh, J for Jesus, K for kinship, L for love, M, it's majestic, N, it's a place of no more, as I said that a couple of weeks ago. 
uh, O for opulence. That was a tough one to come up with. P for peace, Q for great quality, R for rest, S spectacular, T treasures in heaven, U unity, V it's vast, W it's wonderful. Here's the hard one. X. Do you know what zemio means? It means you're, there's a hospitality between the host and the guest. Yeah, I had to look that up. I don't want anybody to think I'm that smart. I didn't know that off the top of my head. Y for Yahweh, Z for Zion. I wanted to just review some basics about heaven. Things we all say we know. But I just think it's really good when I hear the scriptures talk to me about my core beliefs. It is the abode of God in his holy habitation. That's the King James wording from Deuteronomy 26:15. Look down from thy holy habitation from heaven and bless thy people Israel. And it goes on and on. Isaiah 66. This is what the Lord says. Heaven is my home and the earth is my footstool. Could you build me a temple as good as that? Could you build me such a resting place? My hands have made both heaven and earth. They and everything in them are mine. I, the Lord, have spoken. God's pretty awesome. And heaven will be an incredible place. It is also the future home of the redeemed. Christ tells his soon-to-be persecuted followers, Your reward in heaven is great. That's from Matthew 5.12. He urges them to lay up treasures in heaven where presumably they'll be able to access those treasures, but thieves, moth, and rust won't. You find that in Luke 12 and Mark 10. Paul says, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Uh, already, even now, our citizenship is in heaven. And Peter tells Christians they have an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you. So believers rightly look forward to this day. In this tent, our bodies, we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. And that dwelling will itself be physical. We are promised a resurrection. So it won't all be spiritual. Let me just go down a rabbit trail with you. You ready? Nothing to do with what we've said so far. Completely off the beaten path. I've been watching a series on Roswell. The spacecraft and the material and, and the, you know, this, this metal they said that you could bend it and it would go right back to its shape. You could even crease it and it would disappear and just go right back to its original shape. And so we got to talking about, somebody always asked me, well, what do you believe about aliens? I go, well, you forget that I am a preacher and I speak to people. So I see aliens all the time. <laughs> okay, I, I made that up. But no, you're all so beautiful. Well, we, we anybody think it's demons? Yes. Then why do they need a spacecraft? So if they've supposedly got these little people, they spoke with a coroner who was contacted by the army to see if he would bring some small coffins, and he took three coffins out to the base, small ones, because some of these critters were dead, some were alive, and yada, yada. I, what do I think about it? I don't know. But I just wanted to get your mind somewhere else. Because now it's gone, isn't it? So are there really aliens? Did, did Jesus have to go to other worlds and die for their sins? Because as far as we know, there's no other place in our solar system that is habitable. It needs oxygen and water. You don't have oxygen and water and we are the most ideally located planet in the solar system. 
perfect distance from the sun. Further we'd freeze to death, closer we'd burn up. Our moon is perfect to keep the ocean in its bounds. On and on and on. We are perfectly situated. God did not make a mistake. Do you think these space alien sightings are happening without God's knowledge? So it's, it's an, an interesting rabbit trail to let your mind go down crazy places. They're all the supposed proof. And yet, they can't come up with any proof. Nobody has produced any real evidence. We have supposed eyewitnesses who supposedly seen things, but nobody has ever come up with that material. Nobody has ever really shown us an alien. So until I see the proof, I'm not eating the pudding. Oh, are we done with that? I just thought that was fun. I was completely free. We know that our government's so good at keeping us. Well, we know the government never lies. <laughs> we can believe everything they say. And they always keep secrets. There's no leaks. <laughs> and so, signs in the heavens. Uh, another rabbit trail. Did you hear recently of, of the the loud noises that are being recorded around the world. Yes. And some people describe it as the, a wet finger on a crystal rim of a glass, this moaning, groaning, and loud boom, shaking windows, and not just in one location, but all over the globe. Signs in the, and wonders in the heavens in the last days. Unexplainable, nobody knows the cause. Heaven is not just the sky and the stars. We know that even in the first chapter of the Bible, heaven is described as more than that. It becomes the abode of God. It's the abode of angels. God is not alone in heaven. Jacob had a divinely given dream. Angels were ascending and descending down a ladder that reached into heaven, Genesis 28. The prophet Micaiah not to be confused with the prophet Micah. Micaiah is one of the four disciples of Elijah. He saw a vision of the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing beside him. You find that story in 1 Kings 22. Isaiah had a similar but more specific vision. He saw particular angels, the seraphim, unlike the cherubim that Phil claimed that he was. And hearing what they proclaimed around the divine throne. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. I, I wish you would let your imagination go in your mind's eye. See and hear that. Can you put yourself on the scene in heaven? Hear and see and then get a sense of what that must be like. The majestic throne of God. Blinding light, uh, angels and hosts of heaven crying loudly, holy. That isn't loud. I don't want to do it that loud. Blow out your eardrums. Holy is the Lord. Heaven is a metonymy. There's a word most people don't use. And it's used like this. As in, if they say, the White House said today, that would be a metonymy for the president. Jesus said, the baptism of John, or was it from heaven or from man? That's a metonymy for heaven. Or about the baptism. Was it from heaven? It really means, was it from God? Death will not exist in heaven. Isaiah 25. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away all tears. You ever been sad? We've all been sad. If you've ever suffered great loss and or had a broken heart, 
That'll be over with. How does God fix us so that we no, never have a tear? I don't know. I don't know. <clears throat> Only the righteous people would enter heaven. Verse 20. And, unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. But you know I didn't do a very good job of identifying what chapter and book that verse 20 was in. But I'm guessing Matthew somewhere. <clears throat> Maybe Matthew 5. I'm not sure. So your righteousness... If it wasn't for Jesus applying his righteousness to us, how in the world could your righteousness ever exceed that of the Pharisees? Because they were always doing little things, doing the right thing, supposedly. Well, not only does God erase our bad record, he takes his record and applies it to ours. He was perfect and sinless. So if God didn't do that, if Jesus didn't do that, you, you and I wouldn't have a chance. Very few people are going to enter heaven. Matthew 7. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. There are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. I've, I've said in the past, I'll say it again just because I like to say it. Leonard Ravenhill. If you ever get a chance to read his stuff, there are some things on YouTube. Get a chance to watch it. Leonard Ravenhill. When you're done with that, you'll wonder if you're saved. You'll say, I don't know if I'm even saved. I... <laughs> and it's a good exercise for you because I think every now and then you do need to have the slack jerked out of your chain. Because there is a walk with God that is holy and pure and undefiled. And most of us give lip service to that. But to walk in that way, that requires you and me being uh, a disciple, disciplined. Jesus is preparing heaven for his followers. You know this, John 14. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Our lives will not be complete until we enter heaven. 2 Corinthians 5. We grow weary in our present bodies. And we long to put on our heavenly bodies like new clothing. This isn't a stretch for me to believe. Heaven is much better than earth. I don't, I don't have a problem believing that, do you? Philippians 1.23, Paul says, I'm torn now between two desires. I long to go and be with Christ which would be far better for me. But I also long to stay here with you. And that's kind of how it is, isn't it? I mean, I long to be here, but I really do have a, an ache, a, long, a longing in my heart to go to heaven. But I don't want to leave. But I want to go. But I don't want to leave. But I do want to go. Isn't that kind of where we're at? We, we want to go. Don't necessarily want to leave today, but we want to go. Christians should look forward to heaven, Colossians 3. Since you've been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven. Where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Heaven is the home of the righteous. 2 Peter 3. We're looking forward to the new heavens and the new earth he has promised. A world filled with God's righteousness. And the focus of attention in heaven is Jesus. For the lamb on the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of life-giving water. And God will wipe every tear from their eyes. You know, if you ask what's going to be the most important. Well, I know it's going to be important to see your loved ones. And it will be interesting to see all the saints of old. But most importantly, it's going to be Jesus, isn't it? When you see him, I think it's going to take. I don't know if you're going to have breath. I was going to say take your breath away. But you're going to have a. Uh, transformed supernatural spiritual body that's almost a contradiction a spiritual body you're going to have a supernatural resurrected body like Jesus and yet he could pass through walls and appear in a locked room he seemed to be able to travel at the speed of thought he suddenly appeared with the two disciples on the road to Emmaus and then he prayed and disappeared 
And suddenly he was in a room in Jerusalem with the disciples in a locked room. So, like, not just time travel, like zip travel, like boom, you're there. Think it, you're there. I, it's incredible. And yet it's physical. He said, well, touch me and see. So how do you have a spiritual slash physical being? We, we can't, I can't quite comprehend it. I mean, I, 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 there's, there's, Hank Hanegraaff uses a word, he says, I can apprehend it, I can't comprehend it. I mean, I get it, I believe it. I see what it means, but I don't understand how in the world that happens. But it will. There won't be any sadness in heaven. Revelation 21.4 He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. Here, this one I like. People in heaven will recognize Jesus and others who are there. That's why I used the word identity earlier, and I said I'd get to that at the end, and here we are. After Jesus' resurrection, people knew who he was. Right? They recognized him. And, and he proved it wasn't a spirit because he said, touch me and see. Put your hand on my side. Here's my hands and feet. Check it out. It's me. In the garden when he appeared to Mary, and then he, he spoke her name. She thought he was a gardener. He spoke her name. And she says, oh, Rabboni, teacher, oh, recognition. You and I will know each other. Um, he, was he was recognizable after his resurrection, but stands to reason. We'll also be recognizable in our glorified bodies. The Mount of Transfiguration, Matthew 17. Moses and Elijah appeared. How do we know it's Moses, Moses and Elijah? Or Moses and Elijah? I, I can't talk. I'm not speaking in tongues here. Peter, James, and John knew who they were. Well, they hadn't seen pictures. How did they know? Did Jesus say, oh, hey, Mo. Hey, Eli, what's happening? What's happening, Ja? Jesus didn't speak their names. They just knew who they were. I think there's going to be a... If you ever had the Lord... Uh, I'm going to say it several ways. Speak to you or reveal something to you or show you something. Now, it, usually it's not an audible voice. You just know in your knower. Whatever and wherever that is, you just know. That ever happened to you? Suddenly you know something and... The only thing you can attribute it to is that God showed that to you. Told you, showed you, spoke, however you want to say it. God showed you. I'm wondering if in heaven you just know stuff because you've got a redeemed, Christ-like knower. You just know. Seems reasonable to me. Because we tend to relate everything in heaven to what we know here. It won't be like here. But Peter, James, and John recognized who Jesus was speaking with, Moses and Elijah. By the way, another little rabbit trail. The two witnesses in the book of Revelation who prophesy for a while and then get killed and then get raised from the dead and then get resurrected up into heaven or uh, translated out, raptured out. Some people think it's Moses and Elijah. But other people think because they turn... Uh, they do the miracles that Moses and Elijah did. That one definitely has to be Moses, but the other one, they're not sure if it's Elijah or if it's uh, Enoch, who never died. So um, you can figure that out when we get there. <laughs> yes. Yes. What about that? What about it? <laughs> it's, pretty, it's pretty powerful. Well, they are separate because Jesus is the Son and He is at the right hand of God in the place of authority. So this isn't ventriloquism or sleight of hand. God is on His throne and Jesus is at the right hand of the Father 
No man has seen God at any time. We know nothing about how God looks other than he's brightness beyond bright. But in heaven we will know God? Yes. As well as Jesus. Yes. And if not, you can get your money back. <laughs> Come look me up. I'll, I'll, rec I'll recant. I'll say I have no recollection of that, Senator. Wait a minute. I didn't lie. I just didn't know. I spoke as if I did. It's ne never happened before. First John 3. Dear friends, we are already God's children, but he has not yet shown us what we will be like when Christ appears. But we do know that we will be like him, for we will see him as he really is. So however he is, however God is, we will see him as he really is. So there will be not just an apprehension, a comprehension. I don't mean apprehension as in fear. I mean apprehension as in understanding. That will occur, I believe, because God fixes our mind to have no more sorrow. Because there will be no more death, um, in heaven, it will be a lot like some of the men's heads in here. No parting there. <laughs> you can ask another question. Yes. Who are those people? Well, some, some people, as like they say, they some. That God and Jesus are the same? Well, they are and they aren't. They're the same in unity, same in thought, same in action, deed, spirit, etc. But J Jesus is God's son. They're not the same. The Pentecostal Oneness Church, sometimes called the Pentecostals. Uh, there's YouTubes of great singing by the Pentecostals like Alexandria. Those are what we call Jesus-only church. They believe that... Um, Jesus is God, God is Jesus, and there are just different modes that he appears in, in and um, they have other odd beliefs. They separated from the Assemblies of God way, way back in the early 1900s because after some camp meeting of fasting and praying for two or three weeks, some guy went running through the campground, he had a new revelation, and the oneness denomination was born. And so the oneness Pentecostals are to be avoided um, because they are cultic in nature and they have distorted and um, redefined the identity of God. And for my um, evaluation, if you try to redefine the nature of God, you're no longer my fellow believer. You are out there on a ledge all by yourself. I, I, you can sing all the same songs, shout and cry and carry on I don't care if you mess with the nature of God you're a um, you're a heretic uh, an apostate believes too little where you deny the divinity of Jesus you deny the resurrection you deny the efficacy of the blood you're apostate you believe too little if you're a heretic you believe everything we believe and some more it's that some more that, in my book, cuts you out of the herd. You're not part of the family of God. I'm sorry. You can't believe more than. We have the repository of divine revelation in the Holy Scriptures, the Bible. And there are various translations of the Bible, but we don't believe in the Apocrypha or the Pseudepigrapha, those extra canonical books. We don't believe those because... The early church fathers did not find them to be inspired. There's some flaw in those books, either on theology, morality, or some other nature. They are not consistent with the revealed will of God in the scriptures. So, like supposedly a book of Enoch. Well, it's not in the Holy Scriptures. So I don't go there looking for my theology. I don't go to experiences 
or anecdotes from my theology. I don't go to your dream about heaven. I don't go to your vision. I don't read your book. Good though they may be and sincere though you may be, my theological foundation is in the scriptures, period. And you can talk about all your experiences. That's fine. I'm not calling you a liar. But I'm saying if you differ from the book, then there is a problem. And so stay with the scriptures. Stay there. The nature of God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Three distinct identities, entities. One what? God. Three who's? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And that's the most succinct way. And to that, we owe a debt of thanks to Hank Hanegraaff. I don't know if he got it somewhere. But um, that's how the nature of God is. So we do all this, but yes, Chuck? Yes. The way I understand that is they're separate, but they're one. They're on the same page. Yeah, the the best earthly illustration I can think of is an egg. There's the white, there's the yellow, there's the shell. And you point to any one of those and ask somebody what it's an egg. Are they different? Yeah. Are they the same? Yes and no. It's one thing, it's an egg. But there's three parts, for sure. So it might not be the best illustration, but it is one. And you're going to have to live with it. It's the best I can do at the, at the moment. Um, who's going to go to heaven? The reason we talk about heaven is we want people to go. We want everybody to go. Everybody's not going. Wasn't there a song with a line that said, everybody that talks about heaven isn't, ain't going there? I saw on YouTube... I think Shirley Daniels posted this, I think. Uh, some preacher said he was preaching at a church and a young couple came to the altar and asked him for a word from the Lord. Now, let me just talk about that alone for a second. I am, my history is wild-eyed, frothy-mouthed Pentecostal. Roll around on the floor, talk in tongues, ladies shake their hair down, all the bobby pins would fly out. People stomp the floor, people run, people shout. After church, after the sermon, there would be an altar call for those who want to get saved or for those who want to be prayed for. And that portion of the service might last as long as the other part of the service. Sometimes an hour or more. Musicians would be playing. People are praying, singing, shouting, seeking God. Some people over here being prayed for, uh, being baptized in the Holy Spirit. And some people over here getting delivered from who knows what all, cigarettes, <coughs> alcohol, whatever. Uh, people's lives being transformed by people seeking God and the power of God showing up. I grew up in that. Full-fledged Pentecostal church. And I'm not a bit embarrassed to tell you, I miss those days. Now, some people never had that experience. You're not less of a Christian. All that's required to be a believer is believe in Jesus. Do the biblical mandate. Believe he was the son of God, that God raised him from the dead. He died in your place. You deserve to die. He took that and traded his record for yours. And if you believe that and apply that to yourself, the Bible says you're born again. A spiritual life begins in you. Brand new. But man, there's a whole other side of the church that experiences um, a lot of emotion, but I don't know how you could not be emotional when the Holy Ghost shows up with power. How could you not be emotional? I've seen sinners bawling their eyes out. I've seen people slain in the Spirit of God, just knocked down on a concrete floor. And I talked to them after. What did that feel like? It felt like falling into pillows. No catcher. My premise is this. You're going to fall down where he ain't catching you. If God knocks you down, he can catch you. 
But if you're falling as a virtue signal to how spiritual you are, you're going to get hurt. So don't try that here. It better be genuine. That was just a little aside and that was free. But I am still Pentecostal through and through. I still speak in tongues. I still am open to all of the moving of the gifts of the Spirit. What I am not open to is fanaticism or emotionalism run amok. But I certainly understand somebody becoming highly emotional when the Spirit of God shows up with power. And if you've never felt the power of God, it's a sensation like no other. It's just not like your typical Baptist church. Unless it's Southern Baptist. Southern Baptist, maybe. Maybe. I've, I've seen some Southern Baptist churches that are far more demonstrative than some straight-laced, supposedly Pentecostal churches, be they Foursquare, Assembly of God, or whatever. I've seen some Southern Baptist people shout, glory, hallelujah, amen, raise the hands, and I mean, you'd think, whoa, doggies. I mean... If, if I wasn't pastoring, I could, I could find, probably find a Baptist church I'd be comfortable with. Unless they wanted to tell me that the Holy Spirit acts, gifts all died with the apostles. Then I'm thinking, well, you're just, you're just wrong about that, but everything else is really good. <laughs> they, yeah, they teach the word. They emphasize witnessing about Jesus, getting people who are lost, born again, um, I love that about the Baptist. I love that. Some Pentecostals are over the top, you know. This, they're, it's like there's a premium on weird. Who can be the weirdest? Who can have the most far out story? And who can come up with the most bizarre dream or revelation? So I started down that road because of this word from the Lord. In, in that arena, what has become popular in the last 20 to 30 years or so is a word of knowledge or called a word from the Lord about a direction for your life. How somebody wants God's direction. I, I, just, I don't believe in that. God might do that. He, he could do that. But I think those people who want that are too lazy to plow the ground to get a word from God for themselves. I think they live an undisciplined life. They don't have a good prayer life. Otherwise, God will be speaking to them. Because God speaks to you like he speaks to everyone else. But you must be willing to listen. You need to be obedient. You need to be a pursuer of God. So this couple comes down to get a word from God. His preacher says, he said, I immediately knew I should ask this. He said, are you guys sleeping together? And he said, the look on their face told me everything. He said, I will not ask God for anything for you until you repent and forsake that lifestyle, live celibate, move out, live in separate places, and live like you should and honor God. And then maybe I'll pray something for you. But until then, no. I got up and I stormed out and said, they gave me the middle finger. Now, I wasn't sure if they meant literally or if by their leaving, the way they refused to repent was, in effect, giving him the middle finger. So I, I couldn't quite tell that from the story. But the point is, he says, you know, in, in the New Testament, there's many lists of sins of the flesh. And he said in almost every one of them, the very first thing mentioned is sexual sin. And he said it's in the church and it's rampant. It's not just in the pew. He said it's behind the pulpit, behind the keyboard, in the choir loft. He said it's all throughout the church. He said until preachers begin to preach that sin is sin, we cannot have a move of God. He said, you, there's no move of God in the early church. There was no revival in the early church because they were living it. You don't revive something that's alive. You revive what died. And so they were living pure and holy lives. But what was Paul preaching? Forsake sexual sin. Come out from among them. Be holy, says the Lord. Don't touch the unclean thing. Be separate unto me, the Lord says. So we don't preach that kind of old-time Pentecost. That's how I was raised. It's, today it's called legalism. So anytime we don't want to be offended, we just say that's legalism. Or that, that's like the Pharisees. So we have this neat little area we can scoop all that stuff over in so we're not bothered by it. 
Well, uh, if Jesus is coming for a church that's without spot or wrinkle, maybe there needs to be a return to the preaching of the gospel that is unadulterated, Amen. not watered down. There's a narrow gate, a straight and narrow way to heaven, and few there be that find it. And so, Jesus, while merciful, he's merciful to the repentant. His kindness extends to those who seek him. So, let's just, as believers, be careful. Let's ask the Lord for guidance. Let's say, now, now Lord, does this honor you? How do you affiliate? Who do you hang with and why? Uh, the Elks Lodge. It said where you find three or four Elks, you'll find a fifth. <laughs> or, or, yeah, it, yeah, or, or any other, um, what do you call those, service clubs? Yeah, yeah, all those guys. It's, it's altruistic. They want to do good. They want to help the community, help their neighbor. It's wonderful. Do good, but, you know, they sit around and smoke and drink and carry on and tell dirty jokes and, and play cards and do all the things that don't honor Christ. So you just, you want to figure out how can I be most effective in my life that everything I do is worship unto the Lord, and everything I do advertises that I am a believer. And most of us, a lot of times, are failing. We want to go to heaven, right? And, and I want everybody to go. Um, let me finish this up. God, Lord, you're long with you. When the 72 disciples returned, they joyfully reported to the Lord, uh, even the demons obey us. When we use your name, yeah, he said, I, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. And look, I've given you authority over all the power of the enemy. You can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them. Nothing will injure you. But then he said, don't rejoice because evil spirits obey you. Rejoice because your names are registered in heaven. 